there is an option to have it automatically start recording anytime I start these, but that means that it starts recording when I first start the meeting. So there's five minutes of blank space at the beginning. And then if you guys jump in before I do, it starts recording when you get here and not when I get there. It's just weird. So it, normally speaking, it works better if I can just remember to hit the record button. Um, and you guys are doing a good job of reminding me when I can't get when I don't. So. Um, so one of the things that's different about OCHEM versus inorganic chemistry is those phase changes. So in organic chemistry, we're dealing with a lot of stuff that's either ionic or it's in its pure elemental form. Um, and that means that it tends to have less, um, fewer phase changes. Ionic compounds don't melt anywhere near room temperature. And metals can, but they're, they don't, they're not typically in mixtures. A lot of what OCHEM lab is, is part of it is how do we make the reaction happen? in a way that gets us good yield, then a huge chunk of it is how do we purify our product at the end and how do we know we made what we said we made? Um, and so that's the, the sort of the practical aspect that's really useful if you go into the pharmaceutical industry because you, you need to not only have a good method for making your medication, you also need to be able to show to the FDA that your purification methods work and be able to prove to them that what you're telling and them is your patent or what you are patenting as your medication actually has a set molecular structure. If you're, if you're patenting medication, you have to disclose what the chemical molecular structure is of that compound. Um, um, you're allowed to keep secret for a certain amount of time, some of your, your process and, or you can patent some of your process itself, but you only get seven years of, of um, selling a specific pharmaceutical compound before it can become generic, um, meaning that anybody can make it. Although you still might own the patents on the process for making it, so they might have to find a different way to make it legally. Um, or you might, what Dow and DuPont do a lot of times is they keep their actual process completely hidden. Um, if they've got some proprietary step, if they, they think they have a better, chance of keeping the technology for making the compound hidden than the amount of money that they could make in seven years of um, if they patent it, they will disclose what the compound is, but not how they make it. Um, because they never then have to disclose what the process is. And so actually chemical companies are one of the biggest places for industrial espionage these days. Um, industrial espionage sounds really fancy, but it's basically trade secrets. It means that um, and it's chemical companies and um, computer science. Um, I think that there was a big lawsuit that was pretty recent about somebody who left um, Google's self-driving car program and took some code with them. Um, and that was a big deal. And I think that they actually, Google got an injunction filed so that he was not allowed to use that code in any sort of way. I think it wound up setting, like Facebook had some sort of self-driving car program going on, I think it was. Um, they wound up having to shut down the whole program because rather than go to battle with Google over it, they just decided they were too far behind Google anyway, so they just let it go. Um, but uh, you do see that with chemistry and chemical engineering as well, because it's, it's a, the Walter White aspect of it. You know, If you can do it better than any, any other company can, um, and it's because of your proprietary process. That's a big deal. So all of that is a bit of a tangent, but it, it goes to show why the actual process of making the compounds winds up being just as important as the compounds themselves um, in, in a lot of ways, in a lot of venues. Um, so the, the first thing that we're, we will look at here is just some of the named um, glassware that we haven't seen yet. Let me grab my visual aids here. Um, like I said, a lot of it is very similar to stuff that you guys used in Gen Chem. Um, for instance, you've got your good old classic Erlenmeyer flask, it's that conical shaped flask. Um, we actually use a, a variation of this in a lot of different places in OCHEM. Um, one of the ones that winds up being most useful, especially for purification, is called a suction flask which is an Erlenmeyer flask that has a little neck off to the side. 
And this suction flask, what it does is it allows you to put a filter, um, a funnel into a rubber stopper at the top and then put a piece of filter paper on it. And then you can apply a vacuum right here and it just pulls all of your liquid through. Um, so we use this a lot in OCHEM. One of the most common things you'll see is, um, and use suction filter is gonna be like the last thing and then rinse your, your material or your product with acetone while it's on the, um, while it's on the filter paper. Um, so the difference between these two is just that little, that little extra nozzle here um, between an Erlenmeyer and a suction flask. Um, we use a lot of similar stuff in terms of, you know, your basic, this is not a spatula. Anybody remember what this one is called? The rounded one? Yeah, you got it, Emily. I saw that. Scoopula. It's like a spatula, but it's for scooping. So it's a scoopula. Um, sounds like a, a uh, vampire knockoff but it is in fact a piece of um, lab equipment. And then a good old glass stirring rod. Um, I actually got one of these with a, um, with a chemistry themed barware set my wife got me for my birthday last year, a few years ago. Um, that's actually my favorite way to, to stir drinks. I prefer the glass stirring rod. Does anybody remember what this thing is called on the end? This had a funny name too. I don't know why. I actually have no clue why, um, but it's called a rubber policeman. It's a little piece of flexible black rubber, usually cut at an angle like this. Um, if I had to guess, I'd say it's because you use it to sort of like round everything up, corral everything and scrape it all out. Um, so, but I don't know why they went with policeman instead of like, I don't know, a rubber cowboy or something like that it would be make just as much sense by that rationale. Um, some of the, the more specific, the other most important piece of equipment that we use in OCHEM is a way to keep things from heating or keep things heating evenly without burning anything. Um, because if you if you've ever dumped too, you know, too many ingredients into a hot pot at the same time, you know that it winds up, it wind up, might wind up boiling eventually, but first you're going to scorch everything on the bottom, right? Um, and so we, we use instead, we use a round bottom flask that which limits some of that scorching that would happen. We won't, wouldn't technically or typically heat things in an Erlenmeyer flask or a beaker because that, that flat surface being in contact with the, with the hot plate tends to scorch things. And you can burn organic compounds just like burning food. Um, the, you know, and it looks the same too. You get, it, we refer to it as road tar. It's basically a whole bunch of reactions all happen together and you get a big mass of goopy black polymers at the bottom, um, which is almost never what we want. Um, so we use these round bottom flasks and we use them, we, can, we actually heat them in a variety of ways. One of the things that's actually also really helpful is chemists are, are actually pretty clever when it comes to, these, to things like this. This is called a cork ring. And a cork ring is mostly useful because you may notice if you try to set a round bottom flask down, it doesn't stay up. So you have a cork ring, which is just literally just a piece of cork that's got a hole in it and a little inverted cone sits like that in there. So we use that a lot just to hold stuff. So we always have stuff like that around. Um, we, we also have a variety of ways to heat things up. I thought about trying to actually heat some of this stuff up and boil some water to show that, and I figured it'd probably be more trouble than it would be worth considering you wouldn't be able to tell the difference anyway. Um, but I will bring this over here and to show you that one of the more common ways we heat a round bottom flask is we use what's a, called a heating mantle. And it's basically a hot plate that's rounded. It's not flat. It's curved to cup around the round bottom flask. It's shaped in a way so that the round bottom flask sits into it. So it sits. So you just would set that in there. And then when you clamp it in there, it's heating from all sides of the round bottom flask. 
So you still get good contact and it heats everything up uniformly as opposed to just scorching the bottom. Um, although if we are really worried about scorching the compound on the bottom um, and we wanna really heat it gently, we use a similar pr um, process to melting chocolate. Anybody know how you melt chocolate? Do you know what it's called? I wanna say a double boiler, but I don't know if that's right. Double boiler. And those of you guys who are into the life hacks say it's called a microwave. Um, but the uh, the more, more pastry chef way to do it is to use a double boiler. And so we actually have um, these uh, copper hot water baths that actually have, they're kind of like an old school gas stove or a wood, wood burning stove. If you ever seen an old stove top that had like these had metal pieces that you had to take off. You had a fire burning un underneath and then you would take off the metal piece in order to have like a, a hot spot. Um, and so that's what these actually look like is it's just a, it's just an, an empty vessel for you to put water in. And then it has this, this thing on the top and you basically remove as many of these little discs as you need to, to get it to be the right diameter for your round bottom flask. So if I took out a, a couple of them, I get something, a hole that looks like this. Then I can set it here. And then I can take my round bottom flask and it sits right on top there. So then we're, we're heating it by boiling water underneath. And then the steam is gonna condense on the glass and warm it up a lot more gently. Um, so, you know, you'll notice if you watch cooking shows, like clearly I do, um, and my family does anyway, um, there are a lot of similarities in OCHEM lab techniques to, um, to being a pastry chef, because you do have to be very careful with your amounts, like you're being a, a cooking pastry, but you also have um, a lot of the similar techniques. We just kind of have them scaled differently when I'm trying to make something that is you know, if I'm trying to make two grams of material rather than make a whole sheet pan full of cookies. Um, let's see, what else did I want to go over? Oh, the other other important vocab word here with this. So this was a heating mantle was the curved um, hot plate. Um, and you might not be able to see the surface of it is not like Teflon, like a regular hot plate. The surface of it is um, it's actually made with, um, it's a ceramic. So it's like a, it's like clay almost that's, they can actually cast it and get a nice curved shape. And then they basically just have heating tape wound that gets really, really hot around the inside of it in this section here. Um, and for whatever reason, I don't know why, maybe it's something about how they have to make these. Um, they don't put a, a dial like you have on a hot plate um, on a, on a mantle. So hot plate has, you know, stir has, has heat. Mantles don't have that. They just have a cord that comes out of them. There's no control on them whatsoever. And so with that in mind, um, we actually use a piece of equipment that the physics department uses as well. Um, and it's called a, it's just called a rheostat, R-H-E-O, I think. And I don't know where that, the derivation of that. And all it is, it's also called a, a power, mate, power mate. It's just a three-prong plug that has a, a potentiometer attached to it. So you just can regulate how much current goes through it. So you just use this to control your heat on a mantle rather than having the dial built into it. And again, I have no idea why that is, um, other than if I had to speculate, it's probably because this plus the heating element is relatively inexpensive compared to buying a hot plate with the dials built in. These things, these lab grade hot plates that have the stirring um, capacity as well, they run like $280 a piece, um, whereas this is like $40 and a hot plate that you could buy to cook stuff in your in your kitchen is like $40. So I guess it's just be, for cost, especially considering that ceramic 
surface is prone to breaking after an, after a long period of use because ceramics can only be heated up and cooled down so many times before they crack, just like a casserole dish. Um, so I guess it's so that you can replace these a lot cheaper um, when they break as opposed to having to replace this whole apparatus. Given that I know that we have the ability, the technical ability to put a dial on the mantle and there isn't one, I'm guessing there's a good reason for it. I just don't know it 100% off the top of my head. All right, what else was I going to look at? So the, the actual reaction that we were going to, we would be doing normally um, was just cyclohexene plus water and, and um, a couple milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid. Um, when you mix those things together, you get a hydration reaction. So it's just acid catalyzed hydration of cyclohexene. So, and we should make cyclohexanol when we do that. Um, so the, the reaction is really straightforward. It's add, you add five mils of your sulfuric acid to a round bottom flask and you let it cool down to room temperature. You have to let it cool because sulfuric acid is um, pretty volatile and is very exothermic. When you dissociate one of those protons from sulfuric acid, it's a really exothermic reaction. Um, so you need to make sure that you're being very careful when you do that. I think I've mentioned before that I, I broke a big gallon glass Pyrex jar um, when I was making a, a big amount, a large amount of a uh, diluted, I think that was HCl solution, um, just because I let it get too hot. I poured the, the acid in too quickly and it wound up giving off so much heat that it just shattered the, um, the bottle. So always want to make sure we're adding our acid slowly and making sure that when we're adding concentrated acids, we're not doing it too quickly and we're keeping it cool. Um, and then we're wind up, and then if we add five milliliters of our cyclohexene to our sulfuric acid, the, the reaction itself was add the two things together and let it react for 20 to 30 minutes. That's literally what the procedure is at the beginning. That's the reaction itself. The interesting part of this happens when we try to separate out our product. Um, so we would wind up reacting and it says use an air condenser. And so this is the other really important piece of OCAM equipment that I will unhook and show to you. Um, and it, so a condenser in general is just, it's two tubes, two concentric tubes. Um, and it's got, so it's got four outlets because you've got a, an inner section and an outer section. So the, the inner section is connected from end to end here. So things can come in here and come leave here or vice versa. Um, and they go through a pretty narrow little tube in there. It's distinctly narrower than this whole thing because this is so this this is really a double walled tube. So the outside of this um, is what's connected to these two these two hookups, um, and that's never comes whatever you put through here never comes into direct contact with whatever's inside in the inner tube. Um, and so this allows us basically to just cool things down really effectively. Because if you run cold water through the outside, you can keep whatever's on the inside tube the same temperature as your cold water. Um, and so when it's, if it's referred to as an air condenser, that just means we're going to hook it up without attaching um, any water to it. We're just going to let the air that would naturally be moving around here um, would, is in that outer chamber. We're going to let that air cool down our system. Um, and so this is what's called a reflux setup. And so basically what this is, is this is kind of similar to just putting a lid on a pot of boiling water. When you have a lid on a pot of boiling water, you're going to keep most of the steam inside the pot, right? Because it's going to condense on the top and then on the lid and then fall back down. 
Um, and so the goal here is to prevent too much of the vapor from leaving. Because if we didn't have anything hooked up here, if we just had our reaction happening down here, a big chunk of our product would wind up evaporating off before we actually had the reaction being done, especially since it's an exothermic reaction. So what the condenser does, this, this reflux setup is the equivalent of simmering something, not necessarily trying to reduce it. We don't want anything getting out the top. We also don't want to heat a closed system. We can't just put a, a cork in the top of it and heat it, right? Because that's how things blow up. Um, so we have it open. We just use this big condenser. And if it was a really exothermic reaction, if we were using something that evaporated really easily, we would use a water condenser where we had cold, we would have cold water being added down here and then it would fill up from the bottom and then come out the top. You always fill up a condenser with water. You fill it up at the lowest point um, because then you're going to make sure that you don't have any air bubbles still trapped there. It'll fill from the bottom up and gravity will make sure that it fills nice and evenly. If you just put the cold water at the top here, it would drain to the bottom, but then it wouldn't necessarily fill the entire second wall, second chamber. So you always fill a condenser, regardless of whether it's set up for reflux or not, you always fill it from the bottom up and let gravity make sure that that's filling evenly. Um, and so this, this would then be reacting. So if we pretend like I added that stuff and it, you're mixing two things that have, that don't really mix that well, like oil and water, they're just, and then you have a stir bar in there and you just sit and watch it go for 20 to 30 minutes. Um, the other common setup that we use, the other most important setup that we see in organic chemistry is a distillation setup. And we already talked about distillation, um, but what that would actually look like is we take the same condenser as we would have right here, except we're gonna wind up with it at an angle this way. And so what'll happen if we, if we do that, we also have to use what's called a distillation head. And a distillation head is just something that allows vapor to come in and then redirects it at a different angle. Um, and what that's going to allow us to do um, is now if we set it up like this, Hang on. Um, now, when we plug our condenser in, we'll have something that when we run our cold water through it, it's going to wind up with anything volatile that evaporated over here is going to hit the cold glass over here that's being cooled by the water and turn back into a vapor and come down to the bottom. All right, so a distillation setup and a reflex reflux setup both use almost the same pieces of glassware, but they're, subtle, they're slightly different in the, is the condenser straight up so that everything that condenses goes back into the, the reaction, or is it set up so that whatever condenses is removed from the reaction? Um, and so the, there are actually a lot of good applications for distillation besides just making whiskey and spirits. Um, that's the, the most renewable and cost-effective way to make, to make clean drinking water from dirty drinking water is a form of distillation. Um, cause if you take dirty water, most of the stuff, most of the contaminants are either going to be things like heavy metals, um, or bacteria and viruses, both of which have it, um, heat will kill the bacteria and all of that junk in there won't distill at the same temperature as water. You have to get to much higher temperature. And so if you just take dirty water and distill it, you get clean water out the other end. And so there are a lot of, of ways you can use glassware and sunlight to do this distillation. Um, things like where you have, if you have a big globe um, set up where you pour water into it and then it collects at the top and instead of instead of having a separate distillation head like this, you can just have it so that it, you know, a smaller bowl inside a bigger bowl. And so that everything drips, everything that's condensing drips into the small bowl. You put the dirty water outside in the big bowl. 
and your small bowl is empty to start with, and then you just let the sun heat it up. And then overnight, everything will condense as it cools down and all the stuff that condenses will collect in the small, smaller bowl. Um, so there's lots of things. That's what's known as a solar still um, is when you can use sunlight to, to power a distillation. You don't need an external heating source. Um, and so you can get kind of creative with it. This is the classic setup. Um, and they're really all the same as the setup you would use to make something like whiskey bell. It's basically heat one side, collect what condenses off the other side. Um, the other piece, so if we're, after the reaction is done, um, we would, we would neutralize the excess acid by adding some sodium or some potassium hydroxide. Um, but then it says, okay, when the mixture is at room temperature or lower, transfer to a small separatory funnel. So a separatory funnel is the other major piece of glassware. Um, and a separatory funnel, it's called a separatory funnel because it's shaped like a funnel and you use it to separate things. Not very creative, not like rubber policemen, not as, as good of a name. Um, and all a separatory funnel is, is it's a cone of a glass um, shaped as a cone basically that you can seal the top that has a valve at the bottom. Um, and it's important that it's glass because we want to be able to see two layers. And what it does is it basically allows us to have things with two different solubilities. If you have a really non-polar sol um, solvent that won't mix with water, and then you have something that's happening in an aqueous stage, um, like the reaction we just had, if we mix something with a non-polar solvent with our react reaction mixture, our product is going to be more soluble usually for an OCHEM class anyway. Our product is going to be more soluble in the nonpolar layer. And this I just is just for the sake of demonstrating. Um, and it's just vegetable oil and water. Um, but you know, so in, in lab, we would use diethyl ether is really commonly used because it won't mix with water. Um, it evaporates easily and it's also um it's also very slightly polar. So you can get anything that's very slightly polar will wind up preferentially dissolving in the ether layer. Um, and we're saving you some brain cells here as well because diethyl ether is the same ether from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And they used to use an anesthetic in uh, the Civil War. Um, or if it's, you know, they had these elaborate setups that they would use. If you ever seen American Horror Story, the first season there, one of the ghosts in the ghost house was, uh, was a doctor who was addicted to ether or something like that. And they have these like little masks. They look almost like a, like a catcher's mask um, from baseball that you, they would just put a rag soaked in ether inside this mask that would hold it over their face. Um, and it's not particularly good for you. Um, not really something you want to breathe, be breathing too much of, but it's really useful in OCHEM. Um, but th then if we wanted to, if we want to separate these two things, so if we, if we mixed our reaction mixture and our ether here, and we wanted to separate these, what we do is you put your, your hand like this, you would grab the top, always want to make sure that the lid won't pop out. It's the most common thing that people forget or they'll set it down and then the lid will pop up because when you mix these things, you generate pressure inside. And so I, I don't know how many of these things we've broken in the lab um, just in the last year since we started teaching OCHEM. Um, so you always want to put your fingers on top like that and make sure it's closed before you add stuff. Otherwise, it starts draining all over you. Um, and then you just you invert it gently a few times you can see it starts mixing a little bit and then it separates back into two layers. Let me do it one more time just to show. And then as you're doing that, you always have to vent the top to print, vent that pressure build up. You can kind of see if I can get focused close enough. Um, it's kind of cloudy at the top right now. There's still a lot of water mixed in there, but if you give it enough time, it'll wind up settling out and you get two really nice clean layers again. And so then if we were doing this in our reaction and our product was now is more soluble in our top layer, all we have to do is then drain off the bottom layer and we wind up with um, something that has none of the acid and leftovers and then the ionic compounds will dissolve in our nonpolar layer. 
So we are going to remove all of those other reactants, all the byproducts and all the ionic stuff just by doing that. And the process of actually draining it is pretty straightforward. You just turn that and then you close it when you start getting close. So it takes a while at first, um, but then the cone nature here of this means that it, the uh, layer will wind up changing. It'll start going a lot faster, it looks like, despite draining at the same speed. And so, and that's on purpose so that you can, when you get to the end, you can basically remove all of the water and leave almost nothing behind. And then you wind up with something, you've got your water down below and you've got your other layers separated at the top. So that's where, that's where separatory funnel gets its name. That's its whole purpose is it allows us to separate things based on solubility. As long as you can have two liquid layers, whatever's more soluble in the nonpolar layer, if you if you invert it while and wait long enough, the nonpolar solvent or uh, compounds wind up in the nonpolar layer, and the polar compounds stay in the polar layer. Um, and then what the the procedure? So each time you do that, that's called a wash. We just or a liquid liquid extraction. And so now all of our product, in theory, is in this nonpolar layer. Um, we don't necessarily want to throw this away because this stuff still has a little bit of our product in it. So our the procedure actually says, OK, then take another section of DI water and you put it back in with the ether. And you do it again and drain the water. Or sorry, you put it, put it the water that has a little bit of our leftover reactant in the bottom take this and put it back into the separatory funnel with another portion of clean ether. So it becomes basically you have to, kind of tricky to say, okay, this has got most of my product, but some of it's still here. I'm going to take this ether, put it into a separate container, then put this back in, add another portion of ether and do the whole thing again. And you wind up with two portions of ether, the first portion of which probably has 70% of your product. But then by doing it again, you get 70% of the 30% that was left. So 70% of 30% is what, 21%? So you went from getting 21 or from 70% extraction to 70 plus 21%. And so if we really wanted to increase our yield, we'd do it a third time and we'd get 70% of the 9% that was left. You can see how that that exponential relationship is means that the more, the more yield you want, you just have to do this step more times. And you're also going to get some more of the impurities when you do that. So it means you're going to clean it up later. Um, and usually there's a point of diminishing returns. Usually two, maybe three times is all we would do because that's going to get enough of it that we wouldn't care or we need to change our, our procedure. If doing it two or three washes is not enough, then, then we need to rethink things. Um, so then now we have all of our product would be right here. And then the next few steps are basically to start cleaning it up and says, okay, then we're going to take that and we're going to do it again. We're going to do, except we're not just going to use DI water. We're going to take our product and we're going to wash it with sodium hydrogen carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, which is basically going to, sodium bicarbonate is amphoteric, which means it could be an acid or a base. And sodium, so baking soda is what sodium bicarbonate is. We use a, a dilute baking soda solution in here because any of that leftover strong acid or strong base is going to wind up reacting with that baking soda. And we wind up just making water and you remove it and that kind of cleans it up and purifies it. Um, so we wind up wash, that's called a wash because we just put the liquid in, mix it all up, drain the liquid out the bottom. Water is almost always more dense than our in nonpolar solvents. So at that point, we don't even need to take anything out of here. In fact, if I used the same one just for the sake of demonstrating, you see that the oil was on bottom, but then the water replaced it on bottom. So we basically can just pass the water through here and then drain it out the bottom. 
and then that's that's considered washing our product. Um, and so the procedure has you do do it, wash it once with hydrogen carbonate, once with saturated salt brine. It's it's called saturated brine, which is just a solution of of NaCl in water that's saturated. But what that does is it'll actually, because it's saturated, it actually will try and pull water out of our oil layer or ether layer. And so that's that's a wash that dries things. So we're going to start being very specific about how we use these terms. It's a wash that dries our liquid extract, right? And it dries it by pulling the water out. Drying something in OCHEM doesn't mean that it's not a liquid. It means that there's no water in it, right? So adding the saturated brine is going to allow us to draw the water out of the nonpolar layer. And then, um, and so it has us do that. So it has us wash it with sodium bicarbonate to, to neutralize any excess acid, then wash it with salt water to start drawing out most of the water that's in the aqueous layer. And what you would see if you did that is that both layers would start getting less cloudy. Again, it's hard to see with this camera, um, but you can kind of see how it's not super clear up here at the top. Vegetable oil normally is north nice and clear, right? But it's kind of cloudy a little bit. That's mostly because of water that's dissolved in the oil layer. And so if I had some, some saturated brine handy and felt like chance in getting it all over my computer, we could actually do this. And what you should see is after one or two washes, this top layer would start getting more and more clear as you pull out more and more of the water. <laughs> so once it's been dried, um, the last drying step, the reason we want to make sure we dry it is water throws off everything, especially if we're going to try and find a boiling point or a melting point later. Water throws all that off if it's left in there. Um, plus, it winds up causing side reactions, all sorts of stuff. And so the, the last step is once we've washed it to dry it, we're going to dry it one more way, which is basically we would take our oil layer and put it in an Erlenmeyer flask or a round bottom flask, and we'd add an anhydrous ionic compound to it. And so anhydrous just means kind of what it sounds like. It means there is no water. And if you take specific anhydrous compounds, they actually will selectively pull water out. When they're anhydrous, they're so unstable, it tries to pull water into it just from the air around. Um, so those are what are known as drying compounds. If you've ever had a dehumidifying, like a, a jar of dehumidifier, um, they sell those. And they're basically just a compound that is more stable as a hydrate. And so it, so it pulls moisture from the air around it. Well, we might not have that, but if we have our, all of our oil in here with our product in it and a little bit of water left in, if we dump some of those anhydrous compounds in here, any remaining little bit of water goes into that and makes it a hydrate. And it winds up being fairly easy to see visually because what happens is the anhydrous compounds are really not very stable as a crystal. So they make these really, really tiny particles, really, really fine dust like baby powder. Um, but when you expose them to water, they clump up like cat litter. Um, and so what happens is because all of a sudden by adding water, you make the crystal structures more stable. And so you wind up seeing this really fine powder that you're adding turns into these big clumps instead. And you basically just keep adding some of the anhydrous solid until it stops clumping, until it stays that really, really fine baby powder consistency. And then you know that the liquid that's still in there is dry. There's no water dissolved in it anymore. Um, and then we would decant. You guys remember that term from Gen Chem? Do we use that in Gen Chem at all? Maybe once or twice. Decanting in chemistry um, just means that if you have a mixture of a liquid and a solid, you pour the liquid off and you leave the solid behind. So decanting wine, red wine, is not actually about aerating the red wine. It's about leaving the sediment behind in the bottle. Um, and so that's what decanting is in chemistry as well. We would just then take the, that water saturated stuff that all that solid we added, pour the liquid off, 
And now we've got our product dissolved in ether with no water around. And then all we would have to do is then we just let the ether evaporate and we get sort of a film. It's kind of a, it's not really a solid, um, but we can, if you cool it down enough, you can get it to crystallize a little bit. For the most part, it kind of stays as a, as a um, um, sort of oily mess when you, after you're done evaporating the ether. Um, but so the, the general process is, the reaction itself is, was the easiest part of this, right? Mix things together, set up glassware, sit and watch. The bulk of the hard work comes in purifying it at the end. And then you would end up doing a melting point at the very end. And I'll, I'll get a, some good videos of melting point for next week's lab. Um, and since I, or maybe I'll even get a melting point apparatus and I can try and set it up in here. Um, we'll see if I can find good ones on, uh, on YouTube or not. But basically they're just a digital thermometer that's hooked up to a thing that you heat a tiny, tiny amount. Um, they, you use capillary tubes, which you may have used in a biology lab before, which are like, you know, a millimeter diameter, inner diameter. And you take a tiny amount of your product and you put it at the bottom of this capillary tube. Um, so think, think a test tube that's only a millimeter across in diameter. Um, and then, so then you take, have this little capillary tube with a tiny bit of your product at the bottom and you put it in this apparatus that basically just heats it up. And then it has a little magnifying glass that you look through um, and you just watch your digital thermometer. When it starts to melt, you write down a temperature. When it's done melting, you write down the end. And so you really are measuring a melting range, not a melting point. Um, but basically that allows us to say how pretty effectively how um, much of our product we made and that we actually made what we think we made. Because if you wind up with a melting point with that, that doesn't match up with the melting point you were supposed to get, something else happened. You either have leftover reactant or you still have a bunch of water mixed in, um, or you got yeah, some different reaction happened that you weren't expecting. But the melting point is the most common way of evaluating, hey, did I actually make what I was supposed to make? Um, because that is something you need to worry about sometimes is, uh, well, I should have made this, but did I? Let's take a melting point. Um, and it also is actually a good way to estimate how pure something is, because if you get a really wide melting point range, then that indicates that you have a lot of impurity mixed in with your product. Because if you think back to Gen Chem, when we had um, a solution that changed the freezing point of water, right? We usually thought about it in the terms of water, but basically when you added a solute to water, it made the range where the water stayed liquid got bigger, right? So it raised the boiling point and it lowered the freezing point. And so if you have a bunch of impurity mixed into your product, it's going to lower the melting point of your product the same way that water's um, freezing point got lowered. And it makes it happen over a longer range as well. And so if you can, if you have a pure substance, one, your melting point should be right on. But if there's any impurity mixed into it, your melting point will be lower than it should be instead of being able to, and instead of being able to melt, uh, measure a melting point that's say 153.1 to 153.7 Celsius, that was you know less than a degree Celsius, you might see something where it's almost a five degree Celsius range where it's melting. That tells you that your product is not very pure. Um, so it's, it's both a way to verify what you made and a way to estimate how pure it is. Um, and we'll talk more about melting point and some of the practical aspects of that um, next week, probably. Um, I, and actually, I know I just realized that the file that I just uploaded says lab two. Um, but we're in week three, so pay attention to the assignment titles, not what the, what the PDF is, is called. I just forgot to rename it um, when I uploaded it from last year. Um, I will, and now that we're done here, I think that's all I want to talk about for now, unless anybody has any questions at this point. Um, and I wanted specifically to have you guys listen without having the questions in front of you, because I remember watching 
um, you know, the the uh, classic assignment for a substitute teacher was here, watch this movie and answer these questions. And if you have the questions in front of you, you only look for those questions. Um, so the idea was the questions are more or less written right now, but I wanted to um, you guys just listening first and now it's recorded and all of this stuff is stuff is information you can find by by Googling. Why do we do this or what is the purpose of that? Um, so you you guys will be able to go through and fill those out as soon as I finalize them and get them uploaded here in just a second. All right, any any questions so far? My son is being shy, but not so shy that he doesn't show up in the camera. What's up, Dash? Now he's running away. All right, so I'll let you guys go. Um, I'll stop the recording now, and I'll post it as soon as I've got it, um, as soon as it's done processing on Zoom. Um, and then uh, just start working on these. They're just sort of discussion questions. Explain this. Just do, you know, remember to, to do it in your own words. Don't just copy and paste from Wikipedia or, or uh, some other source. Um, try and explain why we do some of these things. What the, what's the purpose of some of these steps? Um, and uh, and that will be your assignment this week. A pretty, pretty low-key assignment, I think. We'll, we'll hunt and find.